Okay. Okay. So Lancelot Jones was born in 1898. Um, his name is very unique. He actually, uh, he went by Lancelot Jones and also Sir Lancelot Garfield Jones. And he actually had a brother whose name was named King Arthur, King Arthur Lafayette Jones. So you can see um, the names have something in common. It has that, um, you know, King Arthur mythology name. And it's pretty interesting because it's not something that is very commonly seen. And it actually kind of made it a little bit easier to trace back um, via records, especially looking at census records. Your name are so unique that it's um, pretty easy to distinguish. And I also gathered that his family, his he was born here in South Florida, and one of our first things that, like, and during this episode is going to be a lot of, is it true? Um, I've read that um, Sir Lancelot Jones was actually born on a boat in Biscayne Bay, and I'm really curious to see if maybe um, Mr. Beeman, if you heard anything about that, but um, do you know anything about that? Well, yeah, that's it's a common story, and and Lance himself told that story in a, uh, <laughs> a, a living history, a, a, a archive, a history video, already, uh, and you know, but of course he was born, so he doesn't really remember that. And there were a number of historians uh, who who said that wasn't true, and. They also say that he was born on Key Biscayne, that he was born in Miami, that Dr. Jackson delivered him. But Lance said his family story was that by the time he got to the mainland and Dr. Jackson got him, all they had to do was spank him and it was a, it was a done deal. Already <laughs> there. But, you know, it certainly does make for a, a much more dramatic story if he was born in the bottom of a boat on the way across from Key Biscayne to downtown Miami area. Yes, it does make it a really fascinating history, and I'm so glad that you were um, able to tell this, this piece of history that he actually said, who knows if it's, it's true or not, but it's definitely a fascinating story, and I was also reading that his family actually moved down here. His family, who his dad was his name, Israel Lafayette Jones, was actually born in Riley, North Carolina in the mid-1850s. And it is presumed that, you know, because of slavery, he was born in the time of slavery, he was um, most likely either a slave or a sharecropper. And, but he made his way down to Florida by the mid 1890s. And an interesting piece of history is that he married um, Moselle Alberry, and she worked at the Peacock Inn. And Mr. Israel Jones, he actually worked at the Peacock Inn. He, I read that he worked at, um, with different prominent families in the area. And for those who um, um, are history buff or have been following some of my segment, we've been talking about the Peacock Inn for different sessions. Um, for example, the Peacock Inn is a hotel that where a lot of the Bahamians, when they first arrived here, they would work at the Peacock Inn. They helped in the construction of the Peacock Inn and also was the center point of Coconut Grove. And the Peacock Inn was built by the Peacock um, who were a British family who immigrated to South Florida in the, um, in the late 1800s. And if you remember in a, my session where I was discussing the different, um, is it true that Macedonia, um, Macedonia was the oldest church in the area, you know, notice that a lot of the parishioners actually worked at the Peacock Inn. So that's another um, interesting story. And he actually, yeah, so he met his wife there at the Peacock Inn, who's actually Bahamian. And um, this is an interesting point because Lewis actually brought a pretty interesting, pointed out a pretty interesting fact, being that Israel Jones was from North Carolina, and then he eventually did purchase, I have here that he purchased um, Porgy Key in 18, 1897, if I'm not mistaken, and he purchased um, Porgy Key, which is 63-acre island for... Um, uh, Mr. Fletcher Albury, he was not related to Moza Albury, just want to make that distinction, for around mm -hmm. $250 to $300. And um, Lewis actually pointed out, you know, it's pretty interesting that he married Bahamians because, you know, Bahamians, um, they were 
a particular labor force here in the early days of South Florida because they knew how to work with the mangroves, they knew how to work with the limestone. Yeah. And I imagine that um, Mr. Israel Jones really did not get that experience until moving down here. But um, like Lewis pointed out, maybe his wife, you know, gave him some tips. Yes. So I actually did want to talk about that a little bit more. Like Jocelyn was saying, uh, since Miss Moselle Albury was a Bahamian of Bahamian descent, uh, Bahamians were a huge part of Miami, especially in those early development days, because it was all full of coal, rock, and limestone. They knew how to develop it. So, you know, him, Mr. Israel Jones, being from at Raleigh, North Carolina, he probably he probably didn't know how to do that when he got here. So we can thank her probably for that, for the amount of work he got done on the Porgy Key when he started his farming plantation. And Luis, he also had um, experience on, on Key Biscayne. You know, it, it was, he was hired to, to tend yes, um, that's true too. on Key Biscayne, not based on his experience in tending groves in tropical areas, but because he knew how to operate boats. That was a big deal. That's you know, true. He, had, he had learned that in, um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, which, where he worked as a stevedore, unloading and, and loading ships. And so that's how he made his way down this way. And so you know, he, he probably picked up some on Key Biscayne as well, but that was just a few years before he actually bought, I think it was nine years before yes. between he moved here and when he bought the property. Yeah, I see in 1893, he was working as the foreman for the Frank, Flood, Frank Budge Pineapple yeah. Plantation. So that's where that was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty interesting as well. And, uh, you know, I think it's pretty incredible to say that, you know, he went from being maybe most possibly a slave or a sharecropper to owning um, that piece of land. And I was wondering, Mr. Beeman, if you knew um, anything more about the history of the purchase or transaction between um, Israel Jones and F Fletcher Albury? Yeah, as I understand it, you know, it, it sounds kind of crazy to me because most people today don't get a month's vacation. But Lance <laughs> spoke about his father having a month of vacation every year from the job on Key Biscayne. And on vacation, you know, he wasn't tra traipsing off to Europe. He was he was going down the Keys. And and what we think of, what most people think of as the Keys from Key Largo down, that was all in pineapple cultivation. Lots and lots of pineapples. That's why Plantation Key is called Plantation Key. And, um, you know, he hung out with these, these folks for a month each year. And he saw that they were happy. They were you know, well-adjusted people and they were working for themselves. And, and over the years, he just like, why am I working for somebody else when these guys are happy working for themselves? I've saved up a little money. And he asked around and found out that um, Fletcher Albury was a little bit past his prime on the pineapple business on, uh, on Porgy Key and was interested in selling his property. And that's where he got it for a dollar an acre. So it was a pretty good investment there. And that, that's how he came into that first piece of property. And of course, he ended up having multiple pieces of property. Yes. The next big one was 250 acres on Totten Key next door. And that was the that was the pineapple plantation that he actually tended for for um, for Budge, I think. Um, yes. And uh, so he ended up buying that. And interestingly, maybe I'm getting too far ahead, but in 1925, he sold that 212 yeah. acre plot for a quarter of a million dollars. Oh my God. So, That's you know, you buy it for a dollar an acre, 250 bucks, and you sell it for a quarter of a million dollars. And that's not even all of it. Right. And what year was this? 1925, the crazy, the crazy year in South Florida with the real estate market. Yes, it is. Oh, wow. That, that probably was the best deal of the year, especially right before <laughs> the hurricane, right before the market crash. Yeah. Oh my God. That's and I also heard that he also bought Old Road Key as well in 1902. And uh, do you know, can you tell us a little bit more about that land? So if I'm just wondering to say, is um, Porgy Key, Totten Key, and Road Key, are they all in close proximity to one another? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I should have maybe brought a map that I could have shared on screen here. But um, if you go down to the southern end of Biscayne National Park, there's a, a body of water that is actually called Jones Lagoon, and it is surrounded 
predominantly by Totten Key and Old Rhodes Key, but also by Porgy Key where they live. So um, yeah, those islands were all in close proximity. They owned Porgy Key, they owned Totten Key, and they owned a portion of Old Rhodes Key. The southern part of Old Rhodes was actually owned by somebody else who would become significant in the story at, an, at another point. But yeah, yes. they owned all of that land there. Um, I guess they were the largest, or some people say the second largest landowners in what is today Biscayne National Park. Oh, wow. That's, that's yeah. pretty incredible, it's especially if you talk about that era. You know, a lot of people are mistaken that, you know, South Florida was not part of the Deep South, but it really was back in those days. And, and um, it's just pretty amazing to think about a man only, like a family only so much land in South Florida and having the opportunity to cultivate the land and provide for his family. And I actually wanted to move on um, to talk about um, some of the, the buildings and also some of the work that the um, Israel Jones started doing. Um, can you talk you know, a little bit more about that as, um, besides plantation? Yeah, so when he moved to, um, to Porgy Key, there was already a house there. And they lived in that. And it was a small house. I think it was a two, three bedroom house, something like that. Um, and that one was destroyed in the 1906 hurricane, I believe. And uh, so then they set about building another house. And that was with the assistance of his brother, Israel's brother, Samuel. And... Um, Lance had been trained as a mason, and so he knew stonework and, and, and concrete and that kind of stuff, and his brother was a carpenter, so there was some good teamwork going on there, and they built a house that uh, stood until the 1970s when um, <laughs> Lance used to test to see if the gas was flowing by putting a flame near it, oh and... <laughs> You know, everything you read says he, it was in a fire. It was. It was in a fire. But it was because <laughs> Lance was testing and the propane tank blew up. Um, uh -huh. To wonder he, he survived at all. So that house was destroyed. Um, and it was a shotgun house. The, the foundation of it is still there on Porgy Key. There's a bronze plaque on the site that was placed by his friends after he died. And uh, people can still legally visit it there's no reason you can't it's very difficult to get to and you have to wade through water and know where you're going and all that kind of stuff we hope to make that easier at some point here in the future with the biscayne national park institute offering trips out there so oh my god that's, that's, that's awesome. an amazing story yes actually so before we had moved on too much further i did want to talk about how successful the jones family was on this farm because you know we brought up 1906 that destroyed the original house 1906 that hurricane actually did a lot of damage to the crops as well uh that that was a year where they had turned i think it was like the first set of pineapples they were developing had pretty much gotten destroyed and they had turned to limes at that point and actually uh, before World War I, the Jones's plantation was considered one of the most successful ones in South Florida. So just wanted to throw that out there too. Yeah, I think mm. it, some, some, there were some estimates that they gave, they paid somebody a quarter of their profits to, to market the limes and get them up north, but they were making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year on limes. And, you know, that doesn't sound, that sounds pretty good to a lot of people sounds today, nice. but, you know, when, <laughs> yeah. you're talking, when you're talking the 30s and 40s, it's insane. It is a lot of money. And it was, yeah. it was John Graham, I believe is the name yeah, that I saw. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to point out that it's pretty interesting considering that the reason why Israel Jones migrated to South Florida was because he originally moved to Orlando and started called to, was part of the orange growth um, crop market. Yeah. But when the great freeze happened, you know, he had to look for employment somewhere else. And it's kind of one of, the, one of the big moments in Florida history that impacted so many things. And now you see him after moving to Tampa, he moved down to Miami. And I basically started his whole story down here. And I think it's just pretty interesting how that one big event, you know, a lot of people associate the great freeze of 1894 to 95 with, you know, the reason why Henry Flagler bought his train line down here to South Florida with the origin story of Miami, like, you know, Julia Tuttle sending the orange grove. But, you know, that great freeze also brought another big person down here to South Florida, which I think is, you know, 
kind of bringing it full circle that, you know, he came yep. back into the crop business as well. Yeah. And I know that um, Mr. Israel Jones, he died September 29th in 1930. And soon right after, you know, Lancelot Jones basically took over, um, took over the, the estate. Yeah, I, I think they had actually, he had actually turned basic operations over to his son a lot earlier than that. He was, he was, in, he, Israel, was instrumental in finding, founding a college up in Jacksonville that ultimately became Florida Memorial College when it was moved down to Miami. But, um, you know, it was, it was one of your HBCUs and he was playing a big part in that. He played a big part in the church. Um, his nickname was Parson Jones, Parson Jones, because he was a member of the, um, the Mount Zion Baptist Church, right near where you are. Um, yes. well, well, maybe not right now, but where the archives are. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, you know, he spent more and more time in the later years there. And, you know, he, they worked. They, they had a tutor out at Porgy Key. They sent the boys off to college in Jacksonville, St. Augustine. I can't remember which one it was. Yes. I think the college moved a couple of times. So, um, yeah, he, he was prepping those boys for, for taking over long before they actually did. And that is kind of like another, is it true? Is it true that, you know, Israel Jones was one of the founding members of Mount Zion? Because it's something that we came across in the archives in our collections that we have. And um, I believe that we found some supporting evidence, but nothing very definitive. But um, Louis, you can talk more about that because I know you processed that collection personally. Yeah, so it's actually, the Jones family is, is, obviously the story is fantastic, but one of the best parts about history is trying to like dispel myths and trying to find out like, you know, is this, is this true? Like what your section is called. And one of the things that we heard a lot was about uh, Israel Parson, Parson Jones being uh, not only like a, a speaker at the church, but being one of the founding members of Mount Zion. And like Jocelyn said, we were trying to find the definitive evidence. It was always said but I've never found anything concrete that detailed it as being so. But the school story that you were telling is that I was reading that on the National Park Service website. And I think one of the, one of the better interactions that came out of that, he was talking to, I think it was a congressman or someone was talking about, uh, he was just talking ill of the school. And he's talking about how skills they're being taught that are not needed. And Israel Jones had raised both of his hands. He's like, yeah, these, they forgot these. So that I thought it was a great story to share. Mm. Yes. And I'm trying to keep things um, chronologically, and I'm, but I know there's so many different pieces of information that kind of spans um, time. And I actually want to bring this up now because um, earlier, Lewis and I, we were discussing about how the Black Archives came in to have some of the materials from the Jones family. And that was in the way of Sarah Woods and her daughters. And um, Lewis, I actually want you to tell this little piece of story about there's kind of like a love story in it. Because I actually, right before getting on, I actually found an interesting piece of information that kind of, you know, like kind of adds another question mark. Doesn't answer anything, just adds a little bit more questions. Okay, so uh, when we had received this collection, you know, archival uh, knowledge, when something comes in together, you keep it together. It's provenance, right? So the reason why the collection is, is Mer the Mercilee Adderley, Lancelot Jones, Sarah Woods family collection is because, so Sarah Woods was actually uh, kind of Lance's like lifelong love. He had never told her how he felt, but they had met when they were very young, when they were teenagers. And so Sarah Wood, her, her family had actually owned a restaurant called Mackey's Restaurant in Overtown. So Lance would come in and deliver key limes and lobsters and crabs and all this. And so she had gone away to college. And when she, she had gotten married and pregnant, but then she'd gotten divorced. And when she came back to Miami, it said that Lance Jones actually had walked into the restaurant trying to deliver just to see her. And he was shocked to see her. He was like visibly shaken. He had dropped his bags and everything. But after kind of getting over this, he asked her if he could be the godfather of this child. And this child ended up, uh, this is Mercilee Adderley. 
And I believe the Mersley Adderley's daughters were Andrea Pratt and Antoinette Miller. He was the godfather of both of them too. And they're the actual, they're the ones who donated the collection to us. So I just thought it was very nice how you have, like we haven't gotten even to like the meat and potatoes of Lance's story, but it has everything in it. Environmentalism, it has a love story in it. It's great. Yeah, and actually before coming on here, I actually found an interesting piece of information. I found in newspaper from 1924 that, um, actually, sorry, married, um, in 1925, Lancelot Jones actually married Elizabeth V. Curley at the age of 25. So it kind of, this is the first time I've seen this name brought up in the research. And it's just one of those things that like brings up more questions and answer because, you know, you do see this deep connection that lasts throughout the ages between Sarah Woods and her family. And I know, you know, this kind of personal information is not easy to find, you know, via records because, you know, it's, pers it's a little bit more personal than like census records and things like that. So, um, Mr. Freeman, I want to know if you heard anything about, you know, Sarah Woods or maybe um, Elizabeth Curley. No, I knew that he went and lived with, um, with, the Woods family after he left the island, which I don't know if we want to give that away. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I have never heard that about Curly. I heard that there was a lady named Nellie Moore that he was sweet oh, on. Oh. That was from somebody. <laughs> um, and I've I've never gone into anything deeper on that. But I can I can give you that reference if you'd like, Luis, and maybe check with him. Um, so no, that's all new stuff to me. This is fascinating. Yeah, it's awesome. kind of, there's so many, is it true? Is it true that Lancelot was kind of <laughs> sweet, had yeah. a lot of sweet parts, but um, just to that's move it on, you know. Well, you know, like he did He did say um, in, in a, an oral history interview, when they were asking him about mm -hmm. his name, um, he said, well, yeah, you know, they, we wanted to have names that would give us respect and our father was very fond of the Arthurian tales so he got King Arthur but he said something like Sir Lancelot you know he was the one he was the lover in the bunch and that's why I got that name <laughs> <laughs> kind of that's alluding so to that a little bit yeah <laughs> oh my god that's that, that makes this story that. just so uh -huh. much better <laughs> and I love stories like these especially because you know it's one thing to talk about you know facts and newspaper and like look at records and show the records but it's another thing about bringing the stories to life you know that really brings that connection to people makes that story so much real and I don't know about you Mr. Beeman but at least in the archives um like I feel sometimes like I know these people I know their faces I know their history and then like you know like it's one of those things like since we a lot of the times we are processing alone we spend so much time with the collection at the end you kind of forget hey I've never met these individuals but stories like this just makes the attachment so much better you know so much like you know so much uh more yeah. um Serious, so yep. I thought that that was pretty interesting, and so now, um, so I know I'm gonna kind of like if I, I'm gonna jump around a little bit to the 1960s and 70s. So, um, but if anybody wants to talk about anything before that, um, actually, real quick, I we had gotten yeah. a question from an anonymous attendee asking what time okay. period we're talking about, and just okay. to reiterate, so we're covering the Jones family story. So it starts with Israel Jones in 1858 in Raleigh, North Carolina, and mm -hmm. kind of it pretty much ends in 1997. So we're covering kind of 140 years of history here. <laughs> so it's it's a large time period. Yes, and, and, and Jocelyn, before we jump to the 50s and 60s, I mean. Lance and and Arthur too um they knew some pretty interesting people way yes, prior yes. to the 60s yes. because you know there was the 1906 hurricane that we talked about and then there was the 26 and the 35 and those hurricanes all served to to really cause some devastation one was the switch the 1906 was was the impetus that made the switch go from pineapples to key limes but those trees would take a long while before they would start to produce so they were growing other things too they were growing sapodilla they were growing um, tomatoes and and they supplemented their income by by fishing and guiding people yes. to go fishing and it just yes. so happens that across Caesar Creek from where they lived was Carl Fisher's Coco Lobo Club Carl Fisher who developed Miami Beach 
So yeah. you know what kind of people he was bringing there to show off mm -hmm. Miami. Hey, come buy a piece of property and I'll show you around a little bit. And so, you know, he he took out four presidents. Lancelot did. You know, Harding, yeah. Hoover, Johnson, Nixon. Um, and he was he was really enamored of President Hoover. He, he oh. liked Hoover a lot. He said he was the awesome. best fisherman of the bunch. Um, <laughs> and and the Hoover the Hoover Presidential Library probably about three years ago had found some footage of Hoover fishing in South Florida, and I got so ridiculously excited because I thought maybe it'll be in at the Coco Lobo Club, and it was just these pictures off the boat, and ultimately there was a picture of. Um, of of one of the lighthouses further down the keys so it wasn't in biscayne but we definitely know that he was hanging out there because lance spent a lot of time talking to him and and lance so, lance had had a lot of fun messing with the presidents oh you know, my god yeah if you you know he'll, he'll say oh so mr johnson i hear you got this thing coming up in the senate when johnson was a senator coming up in January and and he knew how the president felt about it and he would purposely take the opposite side just to talk about it. You know, he was he was he was an instigator. That's awesome. And um that. you know he he talked about some of this in one of the oral histories that we have at the park. So we we need to make sure that you have a copy of that as well at, yes. at your archives. Yeah. Yes, you know, yes, I was gonna yes. ask because when doing research about all this, uh, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon always came up consistently, but then Herbert Hoover was one of those that like it came out sometimes. Uh, Warren Harding came out sometimes. I was like, this is too early. I don't know if to believe it or not, but to hear you say that's awesome. Yeah. That really that oh, yeah, this story. is this is even better. You know, go back to your high school history and reading in in the textbooks about the Teapot Dome scandal that basically. Yeah messed yeah. <laughs> up Harding's administration. You know who was on Adam's Key at the same time as Warren Harding was Albert Fall, the Secretary of the Interior, the <laughs> only one who was in um, impeached on the Teapot mm -hmm. Dome scandal. And wow. Dorsey, some other secretary or, or bigwig was out there. And Lance personally told me, he said, oh, the Teapot Dome scandal was hatched right here in this building. <laughs> oh my god that's <laughs> awesome he told other people that too it's been recorded in some of the oral histories as well so wow. yeah that's that's incredible and it's just like this is just like amazing because like i'm trying to be good on time because i know zoom only allows us a, <laughs> a certain but i swear i think it's going to be a two-part series type of thing because there's so much information but that's that's crazy because we were doing um research into you know lands taking the president's out and we're like could it be is it too early you know mm -hmm. how old would he would he have been um to do that but it's, it's just incredible just to hear from you especially since you know you heard it straight from the horse's mouth kind of like the saying you know right so, and he would have um, been a, he would have been a young dude but um yeah you know, he, he mostly talked about hoover johnson and nixon and and that you know harding was was just kind of a pretty boy he he fished because it was at the club kind of thing he didn't say pretty boy, but that's the kind of uh, thing that yeah. I have in my head. But he was very um, impressed by Johnson and Hoover, but Hoover especially. And and Nixon, he was, the, the oral yeah. history <laughs> interview we have was about six years after um, Nixon resigned. And so he, he said some things. I can't believe that guy did that. And it was just like us talking about politics today. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and just a quick question uh, before we move on. I was wondering, so um, are the same type of plants that were that were planted by the Jones family, the limes and the pineapple, are they still being, grow like, do they still grow in the area? You know, when I first started working at Biscayne National Park, there were some remnant uh, lime trees out there. So national parks are, are supposed to protect ecosystems as they were, not not with um, exotic plants. Now yeah. there are exceptions to that. If you go to Boca Chita Key, which is where Mark Honeywell, the the heating controls guy, owned that island, we have all kinds of exotic plants there because he planted coconut palms all over the place. And there are some trees on on um, Adams Key, where the Coco Lobo Club was, that don't really belong there, but the islands that the Joneses owned really had regrown in because they went fishing and they stopped farming something in the 
the forties, I think, um, they had really grown in a lot more. And so Cruz went in and mostly removed all of those um, okay. exotic trees. So definitely no pineapples because they couldn't handle the salt and they would be going with, with saltwater intrusion and rising sea levels. They would be gone now anyway. But there were limes there when I first started working at Biscayne National Park in the, in the very late 80s, but no longer. Okay, okay. I was just wondering because, you know, hearing how much they cultivate and how much they produce, I was wondering if they, there was still any remnants of it. Um, there are so. remnants of other things out there that, that they did. Um, you know, they had to move the limes, and that's not easy on rocky soil. So they built a, a railroad, and I'm not talking like engineers, you know, engines and stuff like that, but they built tracks out there and had hand push carts and, and carts that could be pulled by a tractor on these tracks to move the limes from place to place. And then to get them out to the water, they wanted the water, the, the boats to be able to get in close to shore. And if you've been to Southern Biscayne Bay, you know the water is often this deep up near the islands. Yeah. And so they hand dug through solid rock a 10 foot wide, six foot deep channel that if you look at aerial views of, of the park, you can see this straight as an arrow channel going into the northern part of Totten Key that these boys and their dad dug out by hand. It's it incredible. is an amazing, amazing feat. So there's, there's lots of evidence of them out there still. Um, okay, so I see that we have a couple of questions. Okay, so okay, so there are a couple of questions. So before we move on, since it's talking about a, a earlier time period, I just wanted to address it. So we have a question. If um, it is, let me just go over. It. How did Porgy Key play? Um, how did Porgy Key play in the Underground Railroad South? And this is pretty interesting because when we were coordinating this session. You know, we talked about this a little bit, uh, Mr. Greenman, but you know this history a little bit more than um, I do because I know there's a lot of rumors and there's a lot of misconception of, um, you know, specifically the Florida Underground Railroad. So I don't know if you want to go into it and talk about maybe um, Mr. Walker, too. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a whole nother story. Just um, a glimpse. Yeah. Not, that yeah. is a whole yeah, story. Yeah, yeah. Just, so, so we'll provide the link so people can see the video that, right. um, you know, if they want. So keep in mind that uh, that Israel bought the bought Porgy Key in 1898. So mm -hmm. slavery was long gone. There was no underground railroad running anymore. That is not to say that it didn't come through the park. There's a tradition amongst the Black Seminoles um, that the reason Black Creek is called Black Creek is because people who were living with the Seminoles that had been pushed down the Florida Peninsula, trying to escape from slavery into Spanish Florida, and just the fact that it was wilderness, came out Black Creek and headed over to Andros, where Red Base is the place where lots of um, descendants of those who escaped slavery live today. So I don't know of any evidence of um, Porgy Key being used in that, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm terribly afraid to go into the Jonathan Walker story right now because I get super excited about that and it would probably go on too long. And it's actually more of an Everglades National Park story than a Biscayne story. So um, I'm going to stop because I'm going to get excited. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> we were It is an really excellent funny. story, though. It is amazing. <laughs> I sent Lewis the link, and for those who are interested, I'm oh, going to be posting amazing. the link on the comments, and I'm going to work to do a follow-up session on the Jonathan Walker story and a little bit more history on the um, Florida Underground Railroad, because it's such a it's such a fascinating topic that we can't miss it in this session because we still got a lot to cover. I'm looking at my time, and I'm just knowing like, oh, we ha we haven't even reached the we haven't even reached the 50s or the 60s yet. Yeah. So I'm. Gonna <laughs> Um, so please stay tuned. If you like this session, you know, we're going to keep on doing these type of collaboration with different institutions. Mr. Greenman, I'm definitely going to work on, on another session to bring you back in. And I know we can probably talk about, you know, we'll probably start geeking out, nerding out about yep. some of these subjects. So we'll definitely have Mr. Greenman back. We'll definitely go into um, that um, question uh, in more in depth as it deserves to be, not something that's rushed. So if you like the session, just follow us. We're going to address it. And then we also have another question. It says, did they have a role in prohibition? Did the drones have a role in prohibition? I was doing research on the drones. I never came across anything about um, drones being involved in prohibition. I know there's a lot of 
um, you know, rum running in the, like in South Florida that happened via boats and things like that. But I never came across any information that suggested the Jones were part of that. Uh, have you? I, I never have either. It definitely was growing on, you know, just a few miles north. If you read a book called Charlotte's Story, Charlotte Needhawk and her husband hung out on um, the northern end of Elliott Key during the Depression, and they had to deal with it. Um, you know, but uh, the, the prohibition was part of the downfall of the lime industry if it hadn't been for the hurricanes, you know, because most of that thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year of limes that they were selling was going to northern markets because one of the most popular drinks up north was a gin ricky, which was basically gin and lime juice. And that's where all his limes were going. Their limes were going. <laughs> and so, um, you know, prohibition comes along. It's like, oh, the bottom drops out of the lime market. Oh, that's pretty cool. Wow. So I don't know of any, I don't know of them being involved in any kind of rum running or anything like that. You know, he, he seemed pretty willing to talk about things in some of the oral history interviews that I've listened to, you know, like harassing presidents and stuff like that. So why <laughs> wouldn't he mention that if, if he was involved? And like, I, I think he would have. Yeah. And, um, and I also want to say that, you know, prohibition in Miami, there's a very fascinating history to it as well, especially within the black community. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of newspaper articles talking about different raids, different nightclubs and things like that in a different location where you were able to find alcohol. Um, but that is another story as well. It's, it's a, it's a very fascinating. There's so many key, um, players. Um, we have, um, different location. We have the Copper Bar. We have Clyde Killings. We have that like it's so it's so crazy. But there's so many things. Oh yes, you know. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Freeman, for doing that because we've been talking about the Jones family. And we've been so <laughs> caught up on it. We haven't shown the Jones family. So yeah, um, and and honestly, I don't know everyone who's in these photos for sure. Um, the woman I'm pretty certain is Moselle. And I'll get out of the way here. Um, the older man with the long white beard, I'm pretty sure, is Israel. There's another man on the porch that I think looks too old to be Arthur. So I think yeah. that might be his brother, Samuel. And then um, Arthur would be the next oldest. And the, the man kind of in the front there would be, um, would be Lance. And I don't know who the little girls are either so this is a photo that i don't even know where i found it i you know it's just kind of something that popped up somewhere but the the facial features of of some of them definitely match other earlier pictures we've seen of them so um yeah just just to give it and and this is this is the front porch of that second house that's that we do have um knowledge of that so Okay, and I also want to say, um, you know, the second older gentleman, um, the second older gentleman, I might suspect it might be Moselle's father, because I saw they were living together in the 1900 census as well, and really? he was That's still awesome. around, so it might be Moselle's father. I'd and... never heard about him, you know, I, I heard that she moved to Key West and then came up to the Peacock and then out to Key Biscayne, I didn't hear anything about a dad, that's interesting, cool. Yes, yes. So I have that name and, you know, I'll, I'll post a little bit of information just to um, do it. But uh, I don't have that name with me, but I do have it in my other piece of papers. I've made several copies of a different version. So, um, Mr. Freeman, um, if you can explain what are we seeing now? This this is just what Jones Lagoon looks like today. If If you want to go to Jones Lagoon, it is my favorite part of Biscayne National Park. And I've been there for 24 years. And um, it's it's just so beautiful and so serene. The water is so incredibly shallow and mangroves, little tiny baby mangroves popping up <laughs> and all kinds of cool little channels. There's always sharks to see. There's upside down wow. jellies on the bottom. There's schools of fish. And, you know, the Lancelot, um, talked a lot about wanting to protect these places. And um, again, I don't want to get too far ahead, but, you know, he ultimately did um, yeah. 
Yeah, maybe we're going to get into that. I'll, I'll stop. It's yeah. a perfect oh, okay. segue. Yeah, okay. It's a perfect segue. But um, first, before we get into like, you know, the ultimate act of preservation, I want to talk about um, the 50s <laughs> and the 60s because there was another. So I know there was another push for development in the in that area. And um, it's kind of interesting because, you know, it also involves somebody else at the Black Archives is kind of familiar as well with it, which is L.O. Brooks. I don't know if you heard of Mr. L. O. Brooks, also also known as Luther Brooks, who was the mayor of Islandia, and he was trying to develop it as well. Um, the reason that we know him because he was he's he was a well known slumlord in the um, yeah. Overtown yeah. area. Yeah. So um, I wanted to see your your information, what your knowledge of on L. O. Brooks. Well, yeah, Luther Brooks was the was the mayor of Islandia, and um, Islandia was the city that was created out of the islands that are now Biscayne National Park because Miami Beach was done development, Key Biscayne was developed, and here are these islands that were never connected by roads or bridges. So back in the 60s, there was a push to connect those islands with roads and bridges, build uh, an airport, dredge up the bottom. There was going to be a major yeah. seaport on the mainland. They were going to dredge up that channel and create more uh, islands up there and have a causeway going from Miami Beach, Key Biscayne down to Key Largo. So everything that, you know, that beautiful picture of my favorite place behind me would have been long gone if it were not for the fact that um, the National Monument was established. So Luther Brooks was one of the big pushers for for that, as were lots of people. It was, there were, there were people walking with protest signs, you know, we want Sea Day, which was the, um, the seaport and they wanted that because it was jobs. It, it's, you know, it's exactly the kind of stuff that we see today. It's not any different than that. But in a time before people were really environmentally conscious about things, you know, this protecting fish and stuff, that doesn't make any sense. And it was a very small, dedicated group of people that um, fought to protect the area. Now, Lance was a was a kingpin, if you will, in this, because he was the largest, second largest, whichever you um, go by, um, landowner in what is Sea And he was, he was, or what well, was Islandia. And he was supportive of it initially. And then it just got kind of out of hand. And he realized that everything he knew was going to change drastically. And um, he's quoted in, in a newspaper article when Biscayne National Monument was finally established in 1968. And I just kind of, I, I always nod my head when I say this, because I imagine <laughs> him sitting there nodding his head, um, saying, yeah, yeah, I like the name Monument, because, you know, it indicates that things aren't going to change anymore. Oh, and I, and I think that's what he was looking for. He had, he had known that place from, you know, shortly after he was born until... The day he was lifted off the island, the day before Hurricane Andrew wiped out everything he knew on that island. And, you know, yeah, he had lived in a couple other places here and there, but that was that was his backyard, you know, the place that he loved and he didn't want to see any more change. Yeah. And if you ever been to this game park, I love national parks. I love being, I love the outdoors. I love like, you know, um, the Everglades. And it's such a beautiful place and it's such a special place. And I'm so glad that, you know, it was preserved. But now, since we're, we're getting close to the time to wrap up, I know we're gonna probably get go through this a little bit too fast. I wanna skip ahead now to, like, I'm gonna concentrate on two big events first. It's gonna be the 1992 hurricane. And, you know, like we said, up to this point, um, Lancelot Jones was living in the area for basically most of his life. He's been there. He, um, you know, he was, one, he was part of stopping the development of the islands in the area in the mid 1960s. And now I want to talk about, um, you know, 1992 Hurricane Andrew, because um, unfortunately that caused um, Mr. Lancelot Jones to move away. But, um, you know, here at the Black Archives, part of the collection that Lewis processed included a lot of uh, pictures of the of the island and also his home at, in the aftermath. So um, first, I guess I want to talk to, I want Mr. Beeman to talk about the impact on the island and then I want to, Louis, if you can pull up the pictures. 
real quick. Sure. Uh, I did just want to say because in 1970, it was in 1970 that Lancelot Jones and his sister-in-law did sell oh. the 277 acres to the National Park Service. So it, they, so for how oh, much? Yes. Yeah. I get it. So President Johnson had, in 1968, instituted Biscayne National Park as, a, as the monument that, that Mr. Green was talking about. And obviously the keys were very highly sought after, right? And they had, so real quick, because I wanted to go back to the <laughs> voting thing. The, of, the, of the 18 registered voters in Islandia, 14 of them were the uh, absentee uh, owners, right? They were the rich, the rich landowners who wanted to start developing. Lance Jones was one of the only two full-time residents on these keys, and he did not show up for that vote. So now I'll continue. And so <laughs> according to Park Service archaeologist Brenda Lanzendorf, all right, he's, he could have made three times more than this number if he had sold it to, develop, to the developers. So he sold his land to the federal government for a whopping $1.2 million. And it sounds like a lot, but he could have made almost, he could have been in three to four million dollar range had he sold sold it off to the land developers who wanted it. So, and that's on top of the quarter million that he got in 1925 from in investments of 250, 300 bucks. <laughs> yeah, you can say it's a pretty solid investment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, the reason I want to talk about the hurricane first, because, you know, he lived up into that point. I know he, the National Park Service bought the, the land, but you guys had an agreement with him. Can you please tell us about the agreement? Yeah, he, he insisted that if he sold his land, and he could have sold it to developers. He had actually had offers on small pieces of the property, but he didn't want to sell an acre here, an acre there. He said, if you're going to buy it, you're going to buy it all. And that, that offer never came around. So when the federal government said we want to buy it, that's when he took that offer. Um, but he insisted that he be able to live there for the rest of his life. And that was the intention. So if you look at some of the old maps of the park, there's a little black dot where his house was that says private. And that was his home. But um, as Hurricane Andrew approached and he refused for days to move because he had been through lots of hurricanes and why are you going to leave for another one? Um, like, well, he, he trusted the park rangers who lived on Adams Key across the way. And uh, they said, this is different, Lance. This is really different. And so they, um, they took him off the island the day before as the winds were starting to pick up. And um, I think he did go back. There's some stories that yes. say he never went back. But I think he did go back. But he didn't go back to stay. No. Yeah. yeah. And that's, uh, so that's where the next part of the story comes yeah. in. That he, he lives with Sarah, for the, Sarah Woods, for the next couple years of his life. So, But like you're saying. So yeah, so he did actually go back. I had been reading that as well, uh, that he didn't go back after Hurricane Andrew. He did. Uh, and we have those photos. Oh, no. It says that I, my screen sharing has been disabled. So... Oh. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get that fixed. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, I'm sure it'll be fixed now. I'll get the photos up. Okay, you got it. I I will in a bit. Okay, so I see I see that we have a question, and someone asked, "What is the difference between the sale of Porgy Key?" Let me see. Let me read it. What is the difference between this sale and the sale of property in Collier County? So. Um, I'm not sure if the property it is a property um, land in Collier County. Is that part of the National Park Service? Do you know that, Mr. Breeden? You know, I the person might be referring to um, the land of the Big Cypress National Preserve, which mm -hmm. you know when people ha when people joke about, hey, you believe that? I got some swamp land in Florida to sell you. That's what they're talking about. Is Big Cypress National Preserve that was all owned by lots of different little people, and there was actually a whole office of the National Park Service in Naples just to buy that land back. And then there was a really whack um, exchange of land for a lot of land in Big Cypress for a small piece of land in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, because it was worth more. Um, so there, there are all kinds of weird land things. I don't know the history of that land stuff over in the Big Cypress, Collier County area, but this was an outright purchase of the land from from Lance and um, his his sister-in-law, Arthur's wife. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, because I want to say that I want to say, so I, first I have a couple of questions. So does the national park service oversee the big cypress reserve or yes. is that two different? Okay. Okay. It's a because separate park, but it's, it's under the national park service. There are four national parks in South Florida. Okay. Um, because I, from what I understand, I, I know a little bit of Collier County. I, I know there was some, back in the day, there were some properties that were owned by black families in the area, but I believe the land was taken away by means of imminent domain. So uh, I think that that is um, basically okay. the root of the question. So, you know, I guess this was an outright sale, whereas the other one was imminent domain. And I guess, the, you know, there are different factors that influence that. Yeah, because yeah. The eminent domain is not a popular method, and yeah. it's rarely done anymore. But it was before, and I have no doubt that you know, depending on one's economic means, you probably got yeah. messed over sometimes in those deals. No doubt. Yeah, so and that's I'm, not something I was aware of. Yeah, and, and I'm guessing that because the way that the the terrain and the landscape of the island, it's probably not it was not something easy that you can sell off or develop since there were islands and people were not going to be able to have easy access to it so its appeal it was probably not as much as the land in collier county and a, a lot of it has to do with what the legislation was that congress passes to if they say and you can spend up to x number of dollars on land acquisition from willing owners and stuff like that that's that's how most of the land I don't know of anything that was um, okay. taken by eminent domain in Biscayne National Park. Okay, okay. And so I am ready to share those photos. Awesome. So I'm gonna okay. start it. So this is the first photo. So this is, uh, all of these came in the set in the collection and it was very easy to distinguish them, thankfully. It's not usually the case with photos when you're processing. But these were all of what was left of the property when he went back after Hurricane Andrew. So you can see they had a couple people coming out to help him. Oh, let's continue. All right. So another one. I believe that this is the foundation of the old house on the right here. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse. Uh, go. So this is Lance Jones. And then I don't know who these two gentlemen are. The guy on the right is Keith Woods. Um, and he was kind of like, I think he called himself Lance's caretaker. He lived on a sailboat just offshore there and um, was was a friend. I don't know the guy in the middle. Don't recognize him. It's great that you know Keith Wood's name, though. I, I, I was hoping that you would know the name. I'm glad that's the case. So we got another one. You can see Lance with some sponge. I don't know <laughs> what this man has on his head. <laughs> yeah, that's a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a sponge as well. Yep, that's so oh. funny. Yeah, Lance. Lance continued sponging. Sponging was was disallowed in Biscayne National Park from 1991, but prior to mm -hmm. that, he was still harvesting sponges in the park, and and he used to sell them to the school kids that would come to um, our school programs on Adams Key. And I actually I actually bought one from him. I I still have it here. It's a glove sponge that I keep at my house. It's just like oh, wow. decoration, but I bought this from Lance out of his garbage bag. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's you our garbage. You can see that in the sparks. bottom of the photo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. We transported him. Um, so good. And I believe you have a little bit more photos? Yeah. Yes. So this yeah. is uh this is the dock. I had read a story that some of the National Park Service Rangers had helped construct this dock. Because the original one was destroyed in a hurricane, do you know? Is, I wouldn't, that, I wouldn't that doubt it. The, the The foundations of the pilings are still there underwater, and if you go to this wow. very spot today, that that palm tree I'm pointing to the screen like you can see it. The, that <laughs> palm tree is this right here, here is way way bigger, and you cannot wow. see the house because it's all grown in with mangroves and whatnot. He had kept that clear, but it's all totally grown in, which is one of the reasons it's so hard to find today. But you can find it by looking for that palm tree. And there's another one wow. um, to the right of the dock as well. That's awesome. That's great. So is this the old family foundation or is this yes. the caretakers? This no, is no, that's that's home. the uh, the house that was blown up by the propane tank. And then he lived yeah. off <laughs> to, um, 
in the direction of where that boat is pulled up on shore there. He lived off in an outbuilding there for the last mm, 10, 12 years. Mm, yeah, because okay. from 1982 to, to Hurricane Andrew, so about 10 years. Yeah. And Mr. Bremen. So you see him on the dock. Yeah. Throwing up a peace sign. <laughs> Is this is this the is this where he was living? That was probably this, uh, that's probably it. Park? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. It's so good to get the information on this because like, these photos I was watching, I was looking through them. I was like, man, it's too bad I'll never know what's going on in these photos. But <laughs> now here we are. That's great. And Mr. Greenman, I know. Um, I also just want to say because of the hurricane, you know, Lancelot did move away um, to um, to the to Miami. Yep. And, but I believe that you did meet him. You, and I actually want you to share some of, um, you told me a story about how he would talk to some of the school children and some, uh, a request that he had with the school teacher. Um, and I was wondering if you can tell us that story. Yeah, you can imagine living so far away from town and everything. There were certain creature comforts that you would not have access to. And one of his all time favorites was chocolate mint chip ice cream. And so the rangers who lived on Adams Key always kept chocolate mint chip ice cream in their freezer and on the occasion of, of Lance's visits to entice him to stick around a little bit longer. <laughs> and he also loved key lime pie. And when we would have school kids camping over on Adams Key as part of our three day, two night education program, the, the teachers who were on the inside always knew to bring a key lime pie for Lance because he would always come over, like I said, to sell sponges to the kids and, and it wasn't just like hey i'm here to sell some sponges he would sit down in the classroom with them and you know i, I it was mind-blowing to me you think about how antsy kids are today they didn't have all the distractions of of devices and whatnot back then but can you imagine a group of 25 fourth and fifth graders sitting on the floor around this man pulling sponges one by one out of a garbage can and talking about sponges. And, you know, <laughs> they, they were fascinated by it. And the reason I bought this particular sponge, this is a glove sponge. And I don't know if y'all can see, yeah, you can probably see that. Yes. Yeah. But I remember him pulling this one out and he was, he was a deep thinker and he would look at it and he would run his fingers down in those grooves. And he says, look at that. It's like a forest of trees. This is a piece of art. And um, wow. and I loved that image. And that's why I bought a glove sponge from him because it's a piece of art. And I can see that forest in there every time I look at it. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. And um, I was wondering, did he ever tell you any of the stories about like, you know, going diving for sponges or any of the things that um, when he like lives in the area or anything um, interesting stories because I also want to mention like you know one of my earlier sessions when we started th this program I talk about you know the tale of Black Caesar the pirate mm -hmm. and I noticed that right there's Caesar Creek right behind or right in between the properties and I was wondering if he ever told you any stories or folklore um, about the area or anything like that. Yeah, the, the story of Black Caesar is is a tough one because, you know, it, it spans, depending on what you read, it spans like 120 years or something. Yeah. And, and some of the stuff was written as, far, as part of the uh, Federal Writers Project in the 1930s. It was like long after this guy supposedly lived. Um, so Lance never talked about Black Caesar to me, but the, the island that blocked his view of Adam's Key from his property is called um, Meigs Key, and right behind that is Caesar's Rock. And so Caesar Creek, Caesar's Rock, yeah. all of this folklore is there, but there's not a whole lot to support it. Okay, okay. So it was just pretty interesting because there's so many fascinating tales, and I think I love, and I love fun tales like, too. Yes, yes they, they are. are. You know, because I, when I was doing the research on, like, you know, Black Caesar and things like that, you know, like, you really can't find any evidence, but just the tales, it's just so remarkable and so interesting. And um, so now I think we're basically coming to the end, but I, I do want to say that I do, I do have a comment from the executive director that he was saying that he remembers, um, let me see, he remembers when going on field trip and um, seeing sponges. So I thought that was... Um, um, that was pretty interesting. 
Very cool. Yes, let's see. Um, all right, let me see. Um, I think I have another comment. Give me one second. And Interesting. yeah, I was going to say he, so he's talking about the people would mistake that original photo that Mr. Bremen put up. He said they would mistake that photo with the coconut grove family. And you, you could probably see why they were very, uh, one of the misses, they were very tied into the Florida community, to the South Florida community, even though they were isolated on the island. But it, but it is the Jones family. You can tell it's very clearly Israel Jones in the back there. Yeah. So <laughs> it's very, it's good to have that cleared mm -hmm. up. And now, um, you know, I kind of want to close it out, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, soon after the hurricane, not that soon, but, um, you know, uh, Lancelot Jones did pass away December 22nd, 1997, a year shy of his 100th birthday, which I think is remarkable. He lived a really, like, full life, and his story is so fascinating. And I also want to mention to people that if you guys want to read up more about him, more in detail, please go to the National Park Service website, Google National Park Service, Lancelot Jones, Porgy Key. They have a great, they have compiled a great remarkable history on the island and on the Jones family. So please look it up and, oh, look here. So part of our collection at the Black Archive, we actually have a copy of his obituary. And Louis, I think, um, if you can read into a little bit more, I, I can't tell which church it is. So you right now. It's here. Uh, oof. It's it's being conducted in the Poitier Funeral Home Chapel, so it is. Uh, it's not. It doesn't say it was in a church. Okay, and I also want to mention an interesting fact is that his father, Israel um, Lafayette Jones, was actually buried is buried at Lincoln Memorial um, Park. So it's one of Miami's earliest cemetery, and that's where a lot of well-known people are buried, including. Um, D.A. Dorsey. So, um, you know, it's a lot of history in there. So, I, I don't know about you, but I think it's just so fascinating how, like, a lot of these people that I read about, <laughs> they're, they're there too. And here we have the Jones family as well. And, and to realize that, you know, imagine this, this baby boy, effectively, coming down out of Key Biscayne, down to Porgy Key in a boat, if he looked to the north, he could see the tiniest little glow on the horizon. And that was that five or six year old city called Miami. And when he left <laughs> that island on 19, in 1992, he was looking at, I think at that point, the 12th largest city in the nation, now the eighth. Um, the amount of change that he saw in his lifetime was absolutely extraordinary. So of course he wanted to see it protected. Of course he yeah. loved that name monument and seeing that it wasn't going to change because he had seen so much it's true. Yeah. And yeah, i right. think that is one of the successes of his story is that he was an environmentalist before it was cool to be an environmentalist environmentalist you had alluded to that and it's true because in 1970 i know that that was probably not what was on the forefront right. of people's minds so to have the vision like that is always always tip your hat to men like that and a few years yeah. ago, um, the Dade County Commission renamed Southwest 328th Street, which enters into Biscayne National Park, is called Sir Lancelot Jones Way. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, my God. I definitely want to take a trip there to see, um, you know, Porgy Key, to see, I, I believe it's Jones Creek, right? Jones Lagoon. Jones, Jones Lagoon. I want to see Jones Lagoons. Yeah, anybody that wants to do that, the Biscayne National Park Institute runs trips a couple times a day. Um, and, and right now during COVID, that's tough, but they are still doing it. They're just many fewer people. You can go paddleboarding or kayaking in Jones Lagoon. And while that doesn't necessarily go to the home site, you'll hear a little bit more about the story. And, and you'll see the places that he loved as a kid and as a young man. And um, just to close out, I actually, uh, I, I know it's such a special place and I know why he donated, um, but can you tell us, you know, what this land means to the environment, you know, and what, you know, and how the National Park Service protects it. So we can just finally get a, like a full understanding, you know, why this land is so special, you know, what you're doing and how you're like preserving, you know, Jones legacy himself since he was so into preserving this um, area. Yeah, so the National Park is actually 173,000 acres. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is one small piece of land within that. 
We protect um, the longest stretch of mangrove forest left on Florida's east coast, the entire southern part of Biscayne Bay, the northernmost Florida Keys. Most people think the Keys begin at Key Largo because that's the first one you can drive to, but there's 50 more to the north, and that's the ones we're talking about, and the coral reefs, plus 10,000 years of human history, and this is one story amongst that. So we are protecting the entire area with with the the goal of protecting the ecosystems and the human history as well and you know come on out and and visit us we we tell the stories on a regular basis when the world's not falling apart we have a <laughs> visitor center with films and videos and stuff check out our website we've got some videos and stuff on there if you want to learn some more so um yeah we're we're doing our best like we all are to try and get the word out during this weird weird time we're in all right, guys, I think that's about it. Um, now you guys know the history of the Jones family, the Porgy Key. For those of you who don't know, um, you know, there's lots of information online. Please, you know, support um, our organization, the National Park Service, who are doing a wonderful job to preserving this area and preserving, you know, part of um, Mr. Jones' legacy. You know, support the Black Archives who are telling these Black stories, South Florida. And if you have a recommendation or comment or any other stories that you would like to hear, please leave us a comment. And I'm definitely going to, Mr. Bremen, we're going to work on another segment. I know Lewis had time in his life. He was processing oh, this Oh, this is election. excellent. I'm very happy. And really that was actually the first collection that I had uh, I had worked on when I got to the archives. So that was a great experience. And now to have it come around like this is it touches touches my heart. Very cool. <laughs> All right, and it says that um, we're giving we're getting a lot of um, supporting comments on Facebook. A lot of people love this segment. They did not know this story. Um, so I just want to thank you guys for coming on. We're definitely going to work on another segment coming up soon. We'll probably um, talk about that. Um, Mr. Walker. <laughs> so we'll yes, see we how we can. <laughs> we'll see how He's we so can good. do that. Um, but if you would like more information, please follow um, the National Park Service online. Please follow us on social media. Normally, I'm on Instagram. If you haven't seen our, my other segment, please go on Instagram at Vault South Florida. Vault B H L T S O S O S L O. Um, you can find us online. Uh, we want to bring you these little known stories and um, just want to say thank you so much and um, thank you for joining me. I know we knew we were an hour today, but it was such fascinating history. Kind of have to rush at the end, but thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having thank me. Thank you, Mr. Bremen. It was very nice to meet you, sir. Good to, good to be here. It was fun. All right, guys. Happy Monday. Make sure to catch us tomorrow. Um, on Instagram, we have Alicia's Melton section, uh, Today in Black History. Wednesday it is Postpone. Thursday is profi Legacy Profiles and Greatness. And Friday, it is Postpone as well. But we, um, in between the days, I'm going to be posting some information and photos of what we just talked about, um, of Porky Key and things like that, so you guys can read up on it. All right, guys. Have a good day. Thank you, guys. Bye. That was very nice. Bye -bye. See you later. Bye.